Speaking of good things to drink, Mr. Begley, have you ever had a slusho? No. Have you ever had a fucking slusho? Because everybody in J.J. Abrams' goddamn universe apparently has. <laughs> apparently everybody in J.J. Abrams' bad robot shit loves their slusho, baby. Wee! God, Lord, man. I, you know... I have a very long relationship with Cloverfield. Uh, <laughs> and the fact that we're talking, I feel like I've talked about Cloverfield once a year since these movies came out. Hmm. I don't know why. With, you mean on your show or? Just like in general, in life. It's like Cloverfield's always there. Clover, there, there, is, a, there is a true sequel coming now. But, Interesting. Uh, on this episode of the Culture Cast, my friends, I am joined by my good friend. He is. He's one of my he's one of my all-time favorite people to work with. Yay. He, he's a true mensch. He wakes up heavy every day. <laughs> oh, Your boy. friend and mine, Mr. Mark Begley. Oh, wait. Was she a great big fat person? Oh, that's the wrong episode. <laughs> Was she a great big fat alien? <laughs> I thought you were going to drop any number of the misheard lines from the original Cloverfield trailer. It's a lion. <laughs> I just, do you remember all of that? No, I don't remember any of it. I was See, not oh, in tune man. Oh my to the God. release of this film, See, the first so- film. So that's so that's kind of the weird thing. So on this episode, Mark, I am dragging you to watch the three Cloverfield movies because this was my idea. Yeah. And and I'll tell you right now, I didn't mean didn't mean I didn't, <laughs> I didn't mean mi- to watch any of this. <laughs> I didn't mind being dragged. Actually, one one of these movies I already know I really, really like a lot. The other two I don't actively dislike in any way shape or form i was more curious as to how this viewing would go on the first and the third films because i've only watched those one time through completely prior to this so cloverfield i've caught bits and pieces of multiple times over the years had no interest in it when it came out i missed all of that internet hype you know like with Blair Witch Project I didn't catch any of that I well when Blair Witch came out I <laughs> when Blair Witch came out I didn't even have a computer a personal computer That's that actually had the internet on it so when Cloverfield came out what was that 2000 081808 that date is seared in my memory I saw the preview for Cloverfield attached to the first showing of the day of Transformers and I went and saw transform the original Transformers. Mm-hmm. I went and saw that with a couple friends, and this was this was before the trailer. Kn- anybody knew about it? Like right. I, 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 like I said, I I have to mention I saw the first showing of the day. A because it was the cheapest. B because it was the cheapest. C <laughs> it was the cheapest, and I wasn't going to pay fifteen dollars. See no Transformer movie, and I'm glad I didn't. Why? He's coming. Why is he here? Let's go. <laughs> For Rob, say something to him before he leaves. Rob's awesome. Yeah. I'm gonna miss it. Rob, have fun in Japan. You owe me $11. Yeah. How are you gonna survive without Rob? He's like your main dude. Yeah, no. Hey, how am I gonna survive without you? I don't know, I'm like your main dude. <laughs> what was that noise? He sounded like an animal. Yeah, just relax. Phone calls are pouring into the New York One newsroom as a thunderous, roaring sound. Do you even see something on the roof? What animal sounds like that? Shaking everywhere, man. It's like tremors. Looks like you should have left town a little bit earlier. inflection point i kind of remember before and after cloverfield as a movie goer because cloverfield is one of those movies that like if you were my age 17 18 when this movie came out 
there's probably part of you, if you were into movies, that got wrapped up in the ARG. And then it was like a summer of ARGs. It was this. It was Dark Knight. The Dark Knight had a whole thing. Uh, and then I want to say The Dark Knight Rises did it. Uh, I want to say Prometheus did it as well. Like this, this started a lot of stuff that we kind of almost take for granted now with not filmmakers, but marketing companies really working with filmmakers to craft something a little bit more exciting than just, you know, a trailer or a, a trailer teaser drop. or a yeah. fucking panel at Comic-Con. But right, right. like, you know, that uh, that's why I just kind of want to mention like, cause we're going to talk about the ARG, but I didn't know what, level of exposure you had because again you were not i was 17 when this trailer when i saw the teaser and i'm sure you rewatched the teaser the teaser for this movie the og cloverfield is really successful no i didn't rewatch it or watch it it's so it's uh, amazing like it's it's i read about it but i didn't yeah, watch it <laughs> i remember watching it and just going whatever this movie is i don't even care how what the quality of the movie is like they've hooked me and then you know there you, you watch go. the movie that's a successful campaign then. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so let's let's start with 2008's Cloverfield. So it's directed by Matt Reeves who, you know, <laughs> friend of Richard Haddam. Weird how the universe does that when you know people who n- worked with this guy, to, you know, when our first project Under Siege 2, uh written by Drew Goddard, produced by JJ Abrams, who is a friend of Matt Reeves from I believe either high school or college. Because I I read that, yeah. Richard, well, Richard tells a story on the Under Siege 2 episode where JJ Abrams came over and congratulated them the day that they sold the Under Siege 2 script, which is like mind-boggling and mind-blowing to me to even think about. But this is the this is the this is a bad robot movie, so JJ Abrams is involved, and it stars a whole bunch of actors who look kind of familiar because some of them went on to do a lot more. Some of them went on to make terroristic threats and some of them (laughs) went on to do get the confused for Aubrey Plaza. I kind of feel like, uh, so yeah, talking about Lizzie, which one gets confused for Aubrey. Oh, I feel like Lizzie Kaplan probably does. Uh, TJ Miller and, uh, Adet Yostman, Mike Vogel, Michael Stahl, David, you got a bunch of people. You got some uh, character actors in there who were seen very, uh, quickly, but, uh, Begley, I'm going to kick it to you. Since this is not a movie that you have a, a kind of history with like I do, what is uh, what is your history with Cloverfield? I don't remember when I first watched it. It would have been sometime in the last, since 2013, probably. I know I always say horror comedies are not my jam. And then I negate that by listing all the horror comedies that I actually do like. The found footage, though, is even lower on my subgenre list. And... It's just because of, I just don't, they have those certain things where, okay, insert reason why we're still filming here, insert, you know, these, these built in explanations for why we're doing this kind of thing that get, well, there are some successful ones and I'm trying to think of my favorite right now. And of course I should have written it down, but I don't remember what it is. They're not something I I explore um, like some people really love found footage and can't wait for the next thing. Sure. So sure. anyway, I don't even know if I realized it was found footage until I started watching it completely through the first time. But having said that, watching it this time, aside from the fact of the explanation as to why we're still filming when our lives are in absolute peril, I actually think this is one of the more successful ones. And it worked for me because the whole time they were supposedly in the streets of New York, I was trying to figure out how in the hell did they do this? Because that's one of the things that found footage can miss is relying on CGI. And if you don't nail CGI in a found in a what's supposed to be real footage, you're you've lost half the battle already. Now the creature in this doesn't look all that great sometimes, but <laughs> I couldn't figure out how they did the destruction of New York City. I was like is this all computer generated kind of like how they do the Mandalorian show and all the, I mean, I know it's not the same technique, but I bought into them being in New York city on those streets with buildings falling down and things crashing around them. So I bought into the location and the locale and the destruction very easily. Right. And so uh, kudos to that aspect of the production for sure. And Enjoy. I kind of cared about the characters other than our narrator. 
and I think I came other away our, other than our narrative. <laughs> I came away really enjoying this a lot more than previous viewings, I think. And again, I watched it with my daughter, and that's always so, yeah, you know what? Just so yeah, you know, I, I listened to our Silence of Lambs episode and she, you know, her intro is very funny because she calls you her weird dad, which you're yeah. not you you are weird, but so am I. We're all weird. I mean, you <laughs> gotta be weird to sit and talk about you gotta be weird to sit and talk about a movie from 14 years ago. Like, I, you know, there's 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 just a level of like strange obs- obsessivity with these kinds of things where it's like, why would it why are people watching Cloverfield in 2022 is kind of what I'm driving at. Right. Uh, so what did she think as someone who like wasn't even alive? She enjoyed she enjoyed it and was when they first started showing bits and pieces of the creature. She was like, oh, oh. Did you, you know, tell her what this was before you started showing it? To no, her? I'm sure she had some idea that it had to do with uh, an alien invasion. I think that may have been mm. part of her. Is that what, is that what this is? <laughs> well, I don't know. Well, you know, we'll talk about one that. of the guesses that was thrown out. So when they show the creature and it's enormous, as opposed to like a xenomorph or uh, something that's more human size. I mean, even the queen alien and in, in aliens isn't uh, as tall as a skyscraper. Right. So I think the scale of it caught her off guard and got her attention. Gotcha. And it's just a pretty, the tension is ratcheted up very well. You still get a lot of the, why are you out? We just kept saying, get in the subway, get in the subway. Why aren't you going into the subway that she kept saying, right. you know, they go into a convenience store. They do this, they do that. So it's like, go to the subway. It's underground. Go to the subway. I mean, and they tackle that issue in the movie very well. So there was a lot of that. Ugh, eh, oh no. And I think because the destruction looked so real, that also kept us on edge, especially her since she hadn't seen it before. And I vaguely knew that the vaguely remembered most of the twists and turns of the film, but was still surprised by some of the things they have to do, like rescuing the main, the leads um, X. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That building's toppled over. And right, that, right. so it was fun to see how they did all that stuff. Is all of it super realistic. No, but, you know, again, we're talking about a huge alien or sea creature or whichever way it is. Hey, we'll die. <laughs> Who knows? By the next movie, it might be something else completely again. Yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I hope my friend Yashar, who you have met now, is listening. And I wish he could have joined us for this episode because this was a movie of mass contention between the two of us. And I feel like my opinion, I remember really disliking this movie. Rem- I, this is one of the first movies that I remember having an opinion about that I feel like was formed based on things that I draw from now. If that makes sense. I feel like at some point we as film, you know, film watchers and, and you know, film I don't want to say film critics, but, you know, we talk about film. We are film, but, you know, film critic, whatever the hell you want to call what we do. Movie podcaster. I feel like at some point there comes along a moment where you kind of realize the way you think about movies is starting to change. Mm -hmm. And it's starting to take on kind of a more, I'm not going to say nuanced, but you start noticing things and making connections. And that's what's important with analysis of art is making connections, seeing how this draws from this and what this is trying to do. So this is one of the movies where I remember him and I just getting into these long, drawn-out conversations because when I watched this movie for the first time, I didn't like it. And I'm not sure I like it now. Mm. But I respect the movie for being probably the best found footage movie ever made. And it's definitely, definitely the best for what the budget is because it looks like it's three times the budget of this movie. Yeah. It's like, it's shocking. Like when I, when I rewatched this movie, all I kept thinking to myself was, holy shit, this looks like a $200 million movie. And it's like a quarter of that budget, which is insane because again, like a movie like this may not, I mean, now it's kind of, you know, up in the air, like a big budget release, like Cloverfield, 10 Cloverfield Lane got released in theaters, but Cloverfield Paradox didn't. Cloverfield 2, I don't know where that ends up, but like this kind of movie is very interesting to me because it's such a weird studio movie to exist. It feels completely outside of the studio system in a lot of ways. Like mm-hmm. it feel, it honestly feels like a precursor of things to come in the industry because now you do have J.J. Abrams and Bad Robot as a big production house. They're not just the creators of Lost. Because that's the other thing. I mean, at this point, we're talking about J.J. Abrams. 
the creator of Lost. Now it's J.J. Abrams, director of Star Wars. Produce, I mean, him being the producer of Cloverfield almost is unimportant now. I mean, even with Matt Reeves, you know, Matt Reeves would go on to do Planet of the Apes, The Batman. Mm -hmm. So again, this is a starting point for a lot of people who 14 years later are the movers and shakers in the movie, you know, in the in the contemporary movie industry. But for me, I think my biggest issue with this movie is, man, we're like a month away from 9-11. And this is just like, it's a lot. It's a lot of 9-11 stuff mm. in a way that I wasn't expecting because it, it's, you know, as someone who was 11 when 9-11 happened and you were probably what, in your mid-20s, uh, early 30s? Uh, th- early 30s, yeah. I remember it differently than you remember it, but I have in the last 14 years seen or however many years it's been, I have seen, you know, 21 years, seen all the footage as a lot of us have. And a lot of us who are younger unpacked that. And there's a shot in this movie that is a one, one to one yeah, replication yeah. of a, of one of the more famous pieces of footage from nine 11. You know what I'm talking about? Where the yeah. smoke comes down the down street. The street. Yeah. And I was just thinking to myself, like this is, you know, this is pretty ghoulish. And I don't like this, but at the mm. same time, that's the point. I feel like I, I don't, I don't know if I needed it in my found footage movie, but if you're going to draw from something, I guess uh, that's yeah. a pretty, pretty clear point of reference for a lot of people <clears throat> at the time. A lot majority of Western film going audiences are going to know what the fuck you're referencing. Even if they've never seen that footage, nine 11. That's the thing about this movie that like, as an adult now, I really wasn't anticipating was like, this movie is, it's it's as close to 9-11 in a movie as I think you can get. Like, I don't know what else to describe it as. Like, it's just, it feels like, I don't think like an allegory for 9-11, but like, here is the closest you'll ever get to being in someone's shoes who was there, but it's a monster instead. Right. It's not a surprise that the buildings that they go into are tilted on one another. I mean, it's just like some weird things that I feel like we're just... Thinking about them now, it's oddly specific. Yeah, that's interesting because I didn't even, that never even entered my mind. I caught that obvious reference with when the building collapses and the smoke and debris is going, it's like, oh. And yeah, it's it looks exactly like some of that footage from that I think from even one day. of the characters, I think Rob even says... Like, there are still people out there. Like, I think that is what is said in that mm. clip, too. Because mm-hmm. it's like a very famous clip. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Shot from, I think, like a like a yogurt stand or like a sub like a sub shop, like right near d- Ground Zero. It's haunting stuff. And they, I mean, they do a good job of replicating. It's just like, I don't know if I needed it. Like, I'm not sure I need it now. And 14 years ago, I'm really not sure I needed it. So then do we take it as a... Uh, we were right for starting that war or are we just using something to manipulate viewers into feeling a certain way? That's what I don't, I think it's the latter. I think it's just like, again, you know, I feel like my issues with this movie and your, your, your big issue probably is probably my same big issue. Uh, TJ Miller, right? Like him being kind of a clown aside, the way his character is written in this movie is so unlikable it's shocking that nobody else was like are we are we really giving the whole movie to this guy because like the way the character is written is so unlikable it's just mind blo- it's mind-boggling right. frankly i think if that were done today i'm pretty sure that he wouldn't be as um what's i don't want to say predatory but there's there there's that thing between him and the lizzie kaplan character where it's just like constant. And that drove me nuts. It drove me nuts as well as just the fact that I'm not the biggest fan of his. He, he's been funny in a few movies I've seen, but the shtick gets old after a while. The only plus to having him holding the camera, being the camera person for this film, basically, is that, yes, you hear his voice constantly but you don't have to look at his fucking face the whole time. That's he's, fair. His face is barely in the movie. So you get his constant. Yeah, he's the least. Dia- he is the dialogue. least of all the characters in the movie. He's the only one you see like once. Yeah. He looks in the camera, you know, t- turns it around once or twice and that's it. But and you see him dead. The monster. But it's nonstop talk, like nonstop talk. Oh, oh, God. Oh, no. What do we do? What is that thing? That's the other thing that kind of drives me crazy about found footage and 
this is a prime example of that, that constant, like I can see what's happening. You don't need to react to it. What is that thing? Did you see that? What are those? Uh. <laughs> so the tropes of found footage you're not a fan of. Is that what you're saying? I mean, that's just over you. I'm not it's lazy. I, like, can you imagine wish... writing the script for found footage? Be like, character says, oh, no. <laughs> character <laughs> says, like, run away. Like, I'm trying to think of one that I, I, I probably have a list somewhere of one that I f- think does it very successfully that avoids those tropes. And I wish I could think of what that particular movie is, but I'm more of a fan of like mockumentary style stuff. Yeah. Mockumentary style stuff is works. But better you could do that because... kind of found footage E like you could lean into those tropes without yeah. going like, I understand why, like giving me a very believable reason why you have the camera on almost feels like for me, that's the big need in any found footage. Right. Movie. The, Anytime anybody posts on Twitter, what's your favorite found footage movie? I always use this answer every single time because I actually believe it. The Grey Gardens spoof of on documentary now, and I can never remember what the title of that particular one is called. So it's Bill Hader and Fred Armisen yeah, yeah, yeah. as those two kooks, you know, in that famous documentary, Grey Gardens. The kooky ladies you know mom and daughter i think that live in the old abandoned house out in long island or martha's vineyard or whatever and they're crazy and cat ladies and blah 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 and it fucking turns into a horror movie the last 10 minutes and i'm like that's how you do it when i watch that you start to feel the creepy things coming on with the, with those two and then it goes full-blown horror and i'm like that's how you do a found footage horror movie don't tell me it's a found footage horror movie <laughs> until the last until it's unavoidable and then and that thing's totally sucked me in, and I thought it was just amazing. So any that's that's my answer for best found footage horror, at least is I I didn't know it was a horror movie or a horror show or whatever. Hmm. I lo- I love that. I need to watch that again actually because it's it's done so perfectly. Interesting. You know, I think for me, for something like horror and found footage, I mean, they they kind of you know bread and butter, peanut butter and jelly, like they go together so easily because again, like when it's done really poorly and cheaply, that's why they're doing it that way. It's because it is easy to do and it is cheap. And that's and that is the benefit to found footage because really that's like you could call it cinema verite or you could just call it found footage. I mean, it's those there is almost an interchangeability to it in a lot of ways. It depends on how it's being framed, I guess, is probably the right way of putting it. Depending on how it's framed, it could be cinema verite or found footage. So, I mean, I've seen people argue that this movie is cinema verite. I think there are moments of it where they're kind of in the hospital, but they're fe- like not the hospital, but when they're with the military yeah. mm-hmm. and like, that feels very cinema verite. That feels kind of like verging on like Paul Greengrass, like that very naturalistic style of filmmaking. Cause Paul Greengrass is kind of like, he's in the car with you type thing. Like there's no camera there. Like I, I like that. And they kind of approach it here, but most of the time it definitely feels like it's just mounted and it's, you know, moving with TJ Miller's head. And you know what? And it's found and it's found later. That's to me, literally part of the deal with the Blair, you know, starting with the Blair Witch or even starting with Cannibal Holocaust, where footage was actually found right after it was shot. And right. uh, You know, so that's where you get into the whole aspect of this being re-recorded over an older tape with the lead and and his girlfriend and their trip to Coney Island. I think could have been used better to break. I mean, they use it to break up the action or the suspense, to heighten the suspense kind of artificially. And you get the twist at the end as well, you know, or not really a twist now, but the, the explanation at the end. When they're in with their and when they're actually at Coney Island and you see the the thing fall in the water. Yeah. I, I, yeah. (laughs) I don't know what it again, like the whole thing with the ARG was they quote unquote explained what was going on in the movie with the oil or not the oil company, the tag Ruato company that made slusho and they were uh, drilling at the bottom of the seabed for the stuff that they put in slusho. And (laughs) the monster was at the bottom of the seabed eating that stuff. And by eating the stuff that they put in slusho, the creature grew larger. And so by drilling, they awoke it and it came to New York and destroyed New York. That is what the ARG claims. And then we have two movies later, a completely different explanation essentially being given or something to that effect. But the ARG thing, like, I mean, I mentioned that he did it with this, but, he, you know, J.J. Abrams also did it with Lost a lot. 
I think he's kind of obviously he got his start doing the ARG with Lost, but that was the thing that I remember in the lead up to this movie was the ARG and like how excited, you know, people were for seeing like, you know, there's all this like kind of like Facebook or I guess that would have been MySpace profiles for the Mm -hmm. characters in the movie and all it's, you know, and that I think the issue with Cloverfield even now, because again, I went and looked at some of the ARG stuff and I was watching, you know, stuff on YouTube and reading about it because again, there's a ton of stuff. They really did such a good job at laying the groundwork and the movie doesn't take advantage of it. And I don't think it's the direction. I actually think it's the script. And I actually, it is the script. It's not the direction. Matt Reeves' direction is fine. Actually, right, elevates it way further than it needed to be. And we know he's a competent director. I mean, he was then, he is now. So it's not like I, I question his abilities as a director, but I really dislike in this script that all the, like the, the monster just seems to be following them. It's very lazy. And it's like, this what, what what this movie was trying to be was like on the ground. You see all these people all the time running from Godzilla and you see it in all mm-hmm. the Godzilla movies. You see people running. And so like, yeah, one of those now people would have cameras and you'd be seeing TikToks and YouTubes and blah, 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 blah. So this is a movie's obviously a little prescient because we're a little bit kind of on the cusp of you know the iPhone coming out and wide adoption of smartphones with everybody has a camera. But I don't like that the creature is seemingly following them because that makes it feel less like they're just people who are in Mm -hmm. the city trying to get away. It's more like the monsters following them and chasing after them. And it's just there's no nuance to the story. It's like they go from what's one set piece to another. And that's fine. But it, it feels by the end of the movie, you're just like, yeah, I guess that makes perfect sense that the monster just followed them to Central Park. Yeah, the it, the end. That's where I think both my daughter and I were kind of like, well, huh? But I took it when I'm watching it. I just feel like the the scale of the monster is so big that there really is no. They could travel hundreds of blocks in New York, and that's really like a a step for the monster. So I never quite caught on to. Yes, it seems like he's ever or she is everywhere they end up but i just took the scale disparity as like okay they're traveling i don't know how many square blocks of new york first to get to save the lead's girlfriend i can't i don't know any of the characters names sorry rob rob and uh, beth oh oh that uh is it annabelle odette or whatever her last name is odette, now yes. Or was odette yesman she was in what yeah, odette, uh, odette. Uh, house was she from house is that what yeah she, she was in house she's been on a few she's in that um, Tale of Two Sisters remake that I can never re- remember the title of. But anyway, you know, they go there from the party they were at, or they go when they get to the military triage unit, that kind of stuff. I'm thinking, yeah, it's, that's a lot of blocks covering New York, but that that monster just has to take one step and he's covered the whole city. So, but like you say, at the end, when they get smacked down by it it's like okay well why them (laughs) yeah it it could be traveling across country by now yeah i well and and there's that shot and again it's 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 there for the movie and not for reality which it's again it's like i'm having a heart it, it this is a roller coaster ride this is a dark ride in movie form because the characters do not act logically they act like dummies and because they act like dummies they are involved in, you know, one of them exploding, them getting bitten in half and eaten by the monster because the script necessitates they be beyond morons and go and get involved. When they say they're the kind of characters who when they say don't go that way, not only do they go that way, they run at double speed. Yeah. Yeah. At it. And that's and, and ultimately it's like, well, that's fine and all. I get that you want to make that kind of movie. The problem is the characters are so goddamn stupid that I have a hard time, like you said, remembering their names, feeling sympathy for them. I end up just getting wrapped up in the footage and see it, like just being impressed technically by the movie more than anything else, really. Right. And like that, I think maybe is kind of the way I, I walked away from it this time is going, yeah, if I think about the movie, I think about how visually arresting in a lot of ways that it is and how evocative it is. It is an evocative film. I mean, again, it's evoking terror. I mean, you take the monster out and it's terrorists. I mean, you know, 
put the monster back yeah. in, all of a sudden it's a monster. So yeah. it's that it's that it's like you know you're you have really succinctly replicated something that we don't have, which is a lot of light. I mean, there's not a lot of footage from 9-11 inside of the buildings because people didn't have camera phones. And that's kind of this is what this feels like. It feels mm-hmm. like in a way they're making that. And yeah, it is that part of it is scary and upsetting because again, you think more about the real life ramifications of what we're talking about here. Less a fucking big ass monster with balloons on the side of its head i did feel bad though when lizzie kaplan blew up i will say that (laughs) because i like her (laughs) yeah i mean that's the problem with this movie is the one character you do kind of care about dies immediately i would actually go as far as to say the two characters that they give more time to than our leads are killed very quickly lizzie kaplan and mike vogel who plays are the lead's brother who's much much more entertaining than michael stahl david is but that's not yeah, Michael Saul he's Davis a more fall. dynamic guy. Yeah, uh, yeah. I forgot. I kind of forgot that he it, it gets it on the bridge. Yeah, boy, doesn't he? It's just, <laughs> and it's it's sudden too. But again, it's like it's somebody like has it, to go early, or but it's, it's those moments that are so scary where you see just one of the characters that you've spent eighteen minutes with. Because I was watching first eighteen minutes of this movie is solely nothing to do with the monster, right? And then you and then you have about like the rest of the movie is just like a complete nightmare. But you have this moment where you see his brother on this light pole and you're like, OK, what's going on here? And then he just gets smashed and that's it. Yeah. And it's like that's horrifying again. Like and I, I think the movie does a good enough job of making it horrifying without lingering on how horrifying it is. Well, and they have to keep moving. I mean, you've got right. to, you don't you don't have time to to really. Um, mourn your your fallen soldiers here you no. gotta get get to safety and there are some respites of course like when they do first go in the subway we get a little break and i just kept saying man i hope they break into all the, the hot dog places and all that stuff and get some food and I, that's what i would be doing down I mean, there <laughs> I, I i mean again you know the the you have the character of rob has to go get his girlfriend at her building and she's pinned to the ground by rebar. Like in that situation, I think you or I would do the same thing and we would be called stupid for doing so. Right. But like, again, it's, that's the hard thing about this movie is like the characters are acting stupidly, but like in that situation, I guess the conceit might be that we would all act stupidly. That's the thing. Like the, the whole rescuing of the girlfriend thing is oddly not like heartwarming, but It feels very realistic. Like that feels like I understand that. And there are some like stakes with that because then, you know, we we end up knowing what happens at the end of the movie. So there are some real stakes. I Yeah, I agree that either of us would do that for like I would do try to. Sure, of course. Save my wife and or daughter if they're in that situation. So that that's one of those instances where they're saying don't go that direction and they go that direction. I get that. It's. Some of the other stuff, like you're talking about how dumb people have to be. And that is a common, I mean, that's just a horror trope in general. Like going on the goddamn bridge. Like that's just. Right, right. And my daughter even said that. Like, why are they going on a bridge? Right. With a creature that's from the water. Yeah. Over Even regardless of that, it's over water. You're stuck. Yeah. Like move forward, move forward. You can't go back. Uh, So, yeah, I like it when movies avoid those tropes and i wish i could think of a found footage example but one example i can think of is for uh home invasion films where uh, you get a lot of those same kind of tropes of people doing stupid things and the one that's very successful at avoiding that is your next and because from what i've understand and what i've read the guys that made that movie don't like home invasion right. films because of the tropes that are inherent in it. So let's work our script so that we're avoiding those traps where you are pushing yourself as the writer to, instead of solving a problem by having somebody act stupid, you just have to be a, a more clever writer. So the lead does something smart. What is there to foil that right and then they have to react to that so and i think the second movie in this franchise quote unquote does that well avoids those tropes 
well by having our lead be a smart character. That, that's my, so, I mean, this works. That's not a found footage film. It's not a home invasion film, but we, you don't have to have a dumb character simply to move the plot along and get your stuff in get the fun stuff that you want to get in. You just right. have to be a smarter writer. How do you, how do you feel about some of the other things that Drew Goddard's worked on? Cause he's worked on a couple high profile things, cabin in the woods, world war Z, the Martian. He directed bad times at the El Royale, which I did not see. I like my, I like that movie. Um, not a horror movie though. No, it's not a horror movie. Not a found footage movie either. Cabin in the Woods is pretty fun. I when I think of that kind of movie where they're playing with horror movie tropes, I go with Tucker and Dale versus Evil over Cabin in the Woods. Agreed. I think Cabin in the Woods is massively overrated. But looking at his, I mean, he's written a lot of stuff that is typically pretty smart. Ali- we watched Alias, my wife and I. I think she continued with it after I sort of lost interest. Um, the Martian is fine. I We watched that, I think, in World War Z. I mean, looking at his filmography, I've liked a lot of what he's worked on, either as a producer or, or a writer. Lost, Alias, Ten Cloverfield Lane. I like Bad Times at, at the El Royale or Battle Royale or whatever the fuck it's called. I just, I think, I just think that writing a found footage film is hard. I think it's not something that should be approached lightly. I think it is approached lightly because it is so cheap to make. And because, because it's cheap to make, that means, you know, anybody and their mother feels like they can throw together a script and go out and have somebody wear fangs and pretend to be a vampire. I mean, it's, right. you know, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. I have no problem with the democratization of filmmaking any more than you do. That's what makes found footage so good is, you know, the orig- the OG found footage movie. I mean, yeah, you could say Cannibal Holocaust, but we're talking about success with the kind of success that drew the industry to it. Blair Witch, I mean, that is just two dudes going into the woods with their friends to make a movie. You know, that's not, there's nothing to it. I mean, that's just some friends going, let's make a movie. And that movie has one one hundredth of the visual effects budget that this movie did. One one thousand. But yet they draw on that same well of tropes. And, you know, again, to levels of success that are varied between both projects. I think Cloverfield is kind of outside of Blair Witch. It is the definitive found footage movie, even if it is kind of a big budget Hollywood movie. Like, they don't make move. They n- they're never going to make another found. Fo- they're never going to make another twenty five million dollar found footage movie. That's just like right. That's not going to happen. That doesn't sound like a realistic thing, right? Wait, uh, I, I don't. Yeah, I. I just. I. It, that's a lot. I think nowadays, if people approach something like that, it probably morphs at some point to just a straight right. out narrative, right? Which I mean is the funny part because we have because I guess that's what the ultimate question at the end of the movie is. Where did the creature come from? Like you've mentioned, they mention in the ARG that the creature comes from the water. Maybe there's a falling satellite at the end of the movie that seemed to be what they were going with at one point was kind of had to do with the monster and then they changed it. Yeah, and that always confused me because I just assumed, oh, it landed. Right. But, you know, and the end of the the end of the movie, you have the two leads who go underneath a uh, what is it like a little tunnel in Central Park and they get tunnel. Do they get do they? Do they, well, I guess they died? I guess. Who knows? Doesn't say anything about the people who, uh, doesn't say if they found two corpses with that camcorder, so who knows? So, I have no idea. There was something on the internet on YouTube, the Cloverfield Files. It was a fan-made film, and uh, apparently they got Michael Stahl David to be in it, reprising his role as Rob. Huh. They don't think that that's official. I mean, look, there's another movie coming out, so maybe they'll address it. I can't imagine 14, 15 years later, anybody cares that was <laughs> involved in the original movie, but who knows? I mean, maybe they'll Michael- show up. Michael Stahl David was involved in something as recently as 2019. So, or I think even more recently than that with the Cloverfield files. So, Hey, people still care about this, this movie though. And people like this movie a lot. And I still think that there are a lot of people that really want to know more about Cloverfield. So that brings us to tick 10 Cloverfield lane. Yay. So yeah, this movie not directed by Matt Reeves. It's directed by Dan Trachtenberg, who just had his own big franchise yeah. movie come out with prey, which it's fucking good too, man. I ha- haven't seen it yet. I am excited to watch it. Watched it with the kid, and we both really, really liked it. I, I will have to watch it then, because this movie uh, is not written by Dan Trachtenberg. That movie is Prey, is right? Uh, I believe so, yeah. 
Uh, this movie is written by Josh Campbell, Matt Stukin, and Damien Chazelle. Yeah, Damien Chazelle of Whiplash and La La Land fame. <laughs> uh, based on a story by Josh Campbell and Matt Stukin, it is produced once again by our good friend, Mr. J.J. Abrams, and it stars Mary Elizabeth Winstead, John Goodman, and John Gallagher Jr. And if that sounds like a very short list of people to have in your movie, <laughs> that's because it's a three, it is a stage play. It is a three person story. Yeah. yeah. It's a stage play in a lot of ways. Yeah. Uh, so, Mr. Begley, tell me a little bit about your exposure with the first Cloverfield <clears throat> sequel, Clover, Cloververse. That's a stupid name. <laughs> Sorry, folks. Uh, yeah. I just remember it. This was the first instance of that very obvious. We took an existing IP or property and squeeze it into this. IP yep. that stuff has been done for we've we've talked about this before a lot of the tell Saw, me a little bit more about Hellraiser a, a, a lot of the Hellraiser movies a lot of the Saw movies a lot of the Die Hard movies these franchises Final Destination exactly yeah was they, literally they started start, as an X Files script I believe they start as something else they get bought by a company that has an existing property that's done fairly well or reasonably well and they shoehorn it in make some changes so this i remember hearing the little bits and pieces of this didn't start as a cloverfield movie it was called this it was about this you know these things get tacked on at the end but being a i don't even know if i had seen cloverfield at that point when this movie came out honestly but i like john goodman I like the other guy, the John Gallagher Jr. fairly well, but I really like Mary Elizabeth Winstead. So I was interested in seeing the movie because of that. And when I read the description or maybe even saw the trailer where it's a woman in peril film for the most part, I was like, oh, I, I like that. I, I like that idea. And then I watched it and thought, oh, yeah, this is great up until the end of the film. I think... And I'm just going to put this out here right at the beginning, and I understand why they didn't do it this way, but I think if you had left that Cloverfield name off of this film, it would have been more successful to have that be an absolute surprise at the end. That there I actually honest, are aliens, you mean? Yeah, that there. It's not that it's an alien attack, and it's though, and it's those aliens, or what? You know, we know that whatever they shoehorn, they shoehorn this into the Cloverfield universe. That's fine. I don't think aliens in any way, shape, or form were a part of it. Maybe they were originally. However, regardless of any of that, I think they wanted people to go because. The Cloverfield name is in there. But I honestly think that if you had just released this as 10 Mockingbird Lane and people are in the theater and they're seeing Slusho, they're seeing Kelvin, they're seeing things that are in the J.J. Abrams universe. Right. And they're starting to go, hmm. And then at the end, when she finally sees an alien, either the ship or whatever, she sees um, evidence that this is not a man-made catastrophe or the uh, tragedy or war or something like that. She sees, oh no, this is actually aliens. Then people would have gone, oh shit, this is part of Cloverfield. And that I think would have created the buzz post release. I mean, that would have come out, this came out what year? 2016. Pe so people were very much internet savvy. We're very much this. Mm -hmm. I think that the buzz that they wanted originally would have been created that very first day that it was released and people got out of the theater or even in the theater with their phones and were going, it's a Cloverfield movie. It's a Cloverfield movie. Oh my God. And then, and word of mouth and it, it would have exploded, I think as much by attaching the Cloverfield name to it. That's just my opinion, my uneducated opinion on that. I'm not sure how ed educated they were because what's the point of calling this Cloverfield? Well, that I it ruins. You're expecting a monster to show up at some point. You're expecting one monster to show up, the monster from Cloverfield, right? Which is again like that. That I think for me is like you know this movie is really good, but at the same time, this movie is also not good at all because I can't. I have a hard time at balancing the issues that this movie had coming into it once J.J. Abrams and crew bought it and the movie that we get because I cannot take away the last 10 minutes of this movie. I mean, I'm not going to let it soil my entire viewing experience, but 
that coupled with the 10 Cloverfield Lane name really does this movie no uh, service because this movie is really good. The script about the bunker stuff is really good. It's really well thought out. It's kind of quirky. It's menacing without having to be overtly menacing. John Goodman turns in a fantastic performance that I still contend should have been Oscar nominated for supporting actor. And it wasn't John Gallagher Jr. Doesn't show up in a lot of movies. He's more of a stage actor. He's in, I think, the third season of Westworld. And yeah, I mean, Mary Elizabeth Winstead, my God. I mean, I'm not even a fan of Scott Pilgrim. And I like Mary Elizabeth Winstead. <laughs> and she makes that thing prequel halfway watchable. Right, she right. kind of does. Yeah. But you know what? This movie should never have been called Cloverfield anything. I uh, yeah, that's that's what I was getting at. What my, are they um, thinking? Way. Yeah, I agree. And I think it spoils any surprise at the end. You're not surprised when she gets out and it's aliens. You're expecting that. And have some faith in viewers. Have some faith in turning this into a marketing campaign just by virtue of it being part of that universe without the name attached. Like I said, 10, whatever. What Come up with this street you know, that you lived on. 10, whatever. Because Clo- for one thing, that's misleading because it's not 10 Cloverfield Lane. Nobody's going to have, nobody's going to live on a street that has the name of the, the, the first movie in a, in a not, you know, in a, uh, it doesn't make any sense to call it that. I, I, it should have been a surprise for everybody in those first screenings of the right. film. Like they did with the trailer for the first movie. Right. Where if you went and saw Transformers at midnight or the next morning, you got to see this trailer that you did not know about the movie. And you know what? They even have a reveal moment that they live at 10 Cloverfield Lane. Like, why do you even have this reveal moment in the movie? We know that doesn't have any bearing on literally anything, but Okay. Yeah. Th- it, what's okay. So what's, you know, we haven't even talked about what this movie's about. So Mary Elizabeth Winstead is captured by John Goodman, who is a scientist, I guess, or worked with scientists. And he knows that the aliens are invading. And so he's rushing home. He hits her car, puts her in the bunker with John Gallagher Jr., who I guess he knew he knew him before the whole thing with the bunker. And then the rest of the movie is her trying to figure out whether or not there actually is some sort of catastrophic event going on outside and John Goodman trying to prevent her from leaving the bunker. It's this is a great setup. And then it just yeah. shits the fucking bed so hard. Like the last 10 minutes of this movie are awful. They shoot it in dark evening light for a reason because it's it looks cheap. Because it's not good. Because when you light things really low lit, it's because you're trying to hide the fact that they're not well made. Yeah, it. I I forgive. I think I'm a little more forgiving of the last ten minutes because I enjoy the first, however many minutes come prior. Because, like you mentioned, John Goodman's performance for one thing, and then like I mentioned earlier, I think that she is written as a very smart character and does pretty much everything right. Completely. Um, I've never seen a character tie their thing to their leg and crawl through things like that. That's like, yeah. it's like, <laughs> like, like that's so like this beyond well thought out character moment. She from the instant she wakes up in there. So she's leaving a bad relationship at the beginning of the film. With she's Bradley distraught. Cooper. Distra- distraught, distraught, distraught. I mentioned that to Cleo when I don't know if she knows who he is. I'm sure she does. With Rocket uh, Raccoon. Same. Yes, difference. that's right. That's right. That's right. Um, She's distracted. She's distraught. She's a little bit on guard. She has a funky moment at that gas station where she sees the truck behind her. It's the middle of the night and she's a woman alone. So she's on edge as well. Gets hit, gets wakes up in the bunker with her leg in a brace and she is handcuffed to a bed. So she's obviously her mind goes to the first place. I think most of us go to in that situation that she has been caught by a rapist or, you know, or worse, worse. Right. And so she's, she has that mindset for a while for, for a good while. And so she is trying to escape, even though John Goodman and John Gallagher's character are both telling her, no, you don't want to go outside. And I, I'm always kind of relieved when we get to the point where the woman is outside and Mary Elizabeth Winstead realizes, oh, this part of the story is actually true. Something has happened. There has been some wide scale event 
that has poisoned the air because you get to, it's hard up to that point I think maybe knowing, okay, yes, something is actually happening to say, okay, relax. You're, this isn't the problem. Escaping him isn't the problem just yet. It's, it's this, what's going to, how are you guys going to survive? What is going on outside? That becomes the problem. And it's a little bit more interesting of a problem because they all have to figure out a way to work together to, to, to solve it. I mean, they're, it's solved for them a little bit because they're safe in the bunker. So you you almost expect more of those issues like the the fan going out that they have to solve and she has to go up in the you know that gives her that experience of going into the vents to fix that and so it's I, I just think it's pretty smart at every turn where the problems are solved by someone who's not acting like a dummy like they might do in the first film. Yeah, like I was going to say, Rob from the first film would not cut it two seconds down in the 10. I would contend that the 10 Cloverfield Lane bunker is more dangerous than the monster in Cloverfield is. And, you know, the, the poster says monsters come in many forms. Yeah. And, you know, that's fine. But I think my biggest problem with this movie is because there is that last 10 minutes of abject stupidity. The finale of the film feels truncated with John mm-hmm. Goodman. Like, oh, yeah, like yeah, completely like they 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 give these stupid alien story screen time over John Goodman is what it feels like. And the alien story is only in the last 10 minutes of the movie. That's it. They introduce the aliens for the first time in the last 10 minutes of the movie. Yeah. As opposed I, to hanging it on the John Goodman character having the finale, which is the important character for her to have a meaningful interaction. With. Yeah, I forgot. I It's been a while since I've watched this, this one, but I have watched this multiple times before I watched I watched it on my own I think I had my my wife watch it with me one time and I forget I'm like oh shit we're already to that point we're already to the acid bath point and thinking that that went like you're saying that their interactions were a little longer because it seems like we go from discovering that the girl Megan that he keeps mentioning wasn't his daughter to pretty soon after that John Gallagher's character is is taken out and then very shortly after that john Kidman's character is taken out so yeah i I forget that that happens so rapidly because prior to that we're kind of moving along a little more slowly the pace is a little more stretched out and then it's like bam 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 out to the aliens because that's the important thing i don't i don't know if how i feel about the twist of it turns out howard was keeping a girl down there anyways so he's just a fucking serial killer or a murderer or no different than like the toy box killers or Gary Heidnick. Like, I guess, is that what, yeah, it's like, that's kind of a twist for a different movie. It's the don't breathe twist kind of in a way. Yeah, Like, I like it though. I I I like like it. it. It just doesn't serve this movie. Not the narrative that this movie's going. Well, I think what we, what we accomplished with that is, okay. She does really need to get out of here because at some point she's lulled into, Okay. They yeah, it play is the really montage going and da, 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 yeah. da. well and they're so she's initially trying to get out because she doesn't believe him thinks that he's is actually what he ends up being so we got to stop that so we have the lady outside who ends up dying and because of the poison air so oh okay who he is telling the truth well maybe he's not a creep maybe he's just not a very well social you know he doesn't have good social skills and then oh no Yes, he is a real creep, even worse than I thought, or pretty much exactly what I thought. He has kidnapped a girl, and she apparently died. And most likely, he killed her because she tried to leave. And so I think that gets us back to, oh, shit, I got to get the fuck out of here. Right. Now, if they had done that with the aliens earlier, I wonder how that would play. But I think their, their point is here, oh, I've gotten out. I'm safe. I've crafted myself this wonderful little uh, hazmat suit. And so now I'm now I'm safe. And then, oh, shit, again, once again, we have another twist that's like, no, you're not safe because he was right. And it is this. And there are aliens, I guess. There are aliens and you're screwed. 
actual aliens who may or may not just be giant spaceship with Mal. I uh, yeah. was was that an alien? Was the spaceship the alien? Is that is it like the creature from the first movie where the little things they like shake them off and the big thing is just like a creature that looks like a spaceship? That's kind of what it seems like. Yeah, I am confused by that as well. I'm not sure because you see a couple different things flying around, but then when she's getting sucked up, it's like. She's going up into the butthole of the spaceship, but it's yeah, the mouth. It's like a she... mouth, like a beak. <laughs> it's, uh, I don't, I, you know. Could be, I, could be that that's just their armor and they look like a spaceship. Yeah, I don't know. I was not a fan of pretty much anything from when she gets out of the bunker, but everything else before that is so good. And I, I really wonder if that's where the script changed hands. Like, you know. Yeah, I'm curious too as to what... It's always been my understanding, or I've always assumed it was pretty much a straight woman in peril. Right. The movie. Cellar was the name of the movie. And when she gets out, that's it. Um, so I don't know if there was something else after she gets out in the original. But yeah, I mean, if you're going to do that, like I say, make it a total surprise. Yeah. Not give the audience a really big hint that at some point there is going to be an alien in, in this because right. it's got the Cloverfield name on it. So let me ask you, when you watch this movie for the first time, did you assume because there was Cloverfield in the name, there was going to be some bullshit at the end? That was yeah. my assumption. Okay, yeah. And I, sure. think, I, I think it's think a fair assumption. At some point you go, well, maybe it's not when she gets out and then she takes the helmet off and it can breathe the air. And it's like, oh, OK, I'm fine. You know, but he was crazy. I don't know what happened to that gal, but everything's cool now. And then you start to hear the rattling in the shed and it's like, oh, OK, that is where we're going. I mean, why why else would they call it this if that's not where we're going? You wouldn't yeah. call it that and have it be, you know, like inbred uh, zombie people or something that he had been creating. I don't right. you know. I don't know where else you go. But well, and that's and that is I think that's the thing for me about this movie that I always think about is with the addition of the Cloverfield name, you've now set the expectation that it's going to be one thing. Yeah. And if it's not that then people are going to be equally as upset because it isn't. If there were no aliens at the end, I think people would be, dis there would be a different group of people who'd be disappointed because it has oh, yeah. 10 Cloverfield in the name. And it's not something akin to the original. I mean, that's the thing. If you like the original movie, you might not like this movie. It's yep. completely different. This is totally a, different. This movie is a, a honestly, this film is a film that would probably up until the last 10 minutes feel more at place in the 70s. This is, you know, this is akin yeah. to like a Polanski film in a lot of ways. That, the, yeah. And that's why I really still like it and and excuse the last 10 minutes, because I think that first part is the the first two thirds of the film are great. Uh, when that's I like those kind of movies. When we say it's literally a different movie, it's because it literally is right. a and different it started movie. as a. I I would be curious. I I would be satisfied with her getting out and that pretty much being it and realizing yeah. he was lying. Was I think everything that comes before it is great, and she doesn't have to encounter any any other because that's what that's what a lot of those kind of films do where. You escape the one bad thing and there is another bad thing outside, like his cohort or something, or the guy that's like, oh, I'll take care of you. And then you end up right back in the bunker. Right. You know, that's a lot of times how those movies play out. But knowing that most likely it had nothing to do with <laughs> alien, aliens at all, it, it's just it's kind of a head scratcher. Yeah, I don't know I, what I don't know what drew them to that script to think, oh, we should tack on 10 minutes of alien stuff at the end of this film just to have something with the Cloverfield name on it. I, you know, J.J. Abrams has gone on record saying that he didn't want to do Cloverfield, too, because of films like Godzilla and Pacific Rim, which I think the original Cloverfield, I think, is better than those two movies. I think Cloverfield is probably still the best American made Godzilla film, too, in a lot of ways. It's better than either one of those yeah. three Godzilla movies now. Never mind any one of those three fucking Godzilla movies. But my God, like what in the holy hell they were thinking with this script being a, like it's it doesn't make any sense why this is a Cloverfield movie. I think that's the big takeaway. Every time I watch this movie is like, what does this have to do with Cloverfield? Yeah, no, I nothing, agree. Nothing. And they do like, you know, people want to complain about it and we'll talk about it when we talk about paradox. 
I think Paradox actually makes sense why it's a Cloverfield movie. Yeah. This movie, like, again, like, that's why I said, like, this movie is at times immensely successful. And then at other times, a complete fucking failure because you can't reconcile the two. The last 10 minutes are a different movie. I'm sorry if people don't like me saying that. And I'm sorry that my opinion is I like this movie up until that point. And then I would contend that the people who made this movie should have somebody should have put their fucking foot down and been like, this is this doesn't make any sense because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I agree. For it the looks most part. cheap, man. Save that money for something else. Save it for the marketing campaign. I don't know. Like what J.J. Abrams couldn't make a movie that's not a Cloverfield movie at. You can't just produce a good script. I don't get it. Like, you can't just produce a good script. I guess the point is, in a way, we can't really do the New York setting again. The New York City, Manhattan setting, found footage. You know, let's have it a little ways out from there um, to people that don't know what's going on. But again, why a woman in peril trapped in a bunker? What, what, What about that script? Made you, it could have just been a family, almost like color out of space in a way where something weird right. starts happening on their farm. Right. And or then maybe they have to deal with the small Cloverfield. Like maybe, maybe, maybe this movie is set out in the middle of nowhere and they just have to deal with a bunch of those little parasites because those fucking things are scary. They make you explode if they bite you. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, I I don't know. Like why. a Kelly Hopkinsville Goblin situation where it's like a family under attack, like straw dogs, but with aliens, you know, straw dogs right, with right. aliens. Right. That's Which what is, this movie could have been. Yeah. You know, why not that? I'm like, fuck, let's write that movie. Me and you, straw dogs with aliens. Does that <laughs> exist yet? That's the Kelly Hopkinsville story. Pretty much a, a family under attack by aliens. That's what this should have been. And you know right. what? Then you do have a Cloverfield tie in because at the end of the movie, you oh the power finally came back and you see the oh, we're, we're reporting from New York. You know, the Clover whatever is dead, you know, but the you know, these people are in upstate New York. So the creatures have already made their way up. There. I don't know. We're doing their job for him. Fuck, man. And there's your Cloverfield connection. And you don't and it doesn't have to be set in Louisiana, which is farther from New York than anything else, frankly, could have been. And that may have been the thought process. And they go, well, you know, we actually have this script that's sort of similar to that just sitting here. So we'll just use this. Maybe. Who the fuck knows? That's the problem. It's not very clear where what got excised and what got grafted on because that's what this feels like like I'm, what dialogue is there in the bunker that they really added like right right i mean right because it's all speculation as to what's happening outside right I, I, he mentions aliens but that very well could have been an original part of the script because it didn't have he's to lead anywhere he's being pretending to be her savior he yeah. also just happens to be he, it didn't have to lead anywhere when she got outside. There didn't actually right. have to be a danger outside. Yeah, she could have been got. She could have gotten out and been like the cops were waiting for her type thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, in a different in a, you know what? The other version of this movie, there may have been like people looking for her and they find her at the end, you know, something that's, like that. You know, I don't know. I mean, Earth, who knows what they excise? That's the Earth 312 timeline. I think that you're talking about. Oh, for that movie got released. <laughs> God. Yeah, it's. And, the, and that's the problem with this movie. It's a really good movie. It just, man, suffers suffers so hard from being a Cloverfield movie. Yeah, I don't think it does any, it does not do the film any service to have at the least that name yeah, on it. Know. Yeah, no. And then. And it doesn't help the last one much either. <laughs> right, yeah, because I was about to say, and then we come to the last one where the last one actually is kind of a cloverfield and it has and and it has its own problematic release that pissed everybody off i mean <laughs> that, please i mean again if you're of a certain age with Clo the original cloverfield you remember the arg but we're all of a certain age to remember what they did with cloverfield paradox which was novel uh, yeah I, this one i remember hearing about like oh we're gonna do this again the we're God gonna take an ex we're gonna take an existing script we're gonna jam in Cloverfield, and I actually in this one can tell where they jammed stuff in. I mean, you can tell in this in Ten Cloverfield Lane, it's just really the ending. But so here, wrap around in Clover Ten Cloverfield Lane. Here, it's very obvious as to what's been shoehorned in to make it a Cloverfield movie. And so you hear about this, you hear, you start hearing about, oh, we're doing another one of these, 
and oh it's going to be released some crazy way and then oh i'm sitting at my parents watching the super bowl and a commercial comes on that tells me i can watch it right after on the netflix so i believe we did actually go home and watch it i and we're like what in the hell is this insane thing i know that i watched it as soon as uh the super bowl was over i was at my buddy's house and waiting for my wife to get off of work and him and i sat down and we watched it yeah and uh (laughs) oh I can I can I speak for the both of us in saying the first time we both watched it, we probably both didn't like it very much. I was just absolutely flummoxed by it. Right. It's like there was it's like, why does this exist? There were some interesting visuals and I liked some of the ideas, but what made me laugh was the whole the whole Donald Logue scene where they're watching that news thing and I didn't make the connection probably read about it or saw it online the next day well he had the same last name as John Goodman's character oh and I they're not supposed to be the same character but the lady the newscast lady is the woman that was outside the bunker in the in 10 Cloverfield Lane I didn't I wouldn't have made that connection and I think it's sort of irrelevant except as an Easter egg but it's very obvious that that whole thing was <laughs> slipped into the film to explain how this is a part of the Cloverfield paradox. Or yes, Cloverfield let us universe. watch the television <laughs> shot from behind the character so you don't have to see that their mouths <laughs> yeah, aren't right. moving. And Fucking then it's Gugumbatha Ra is like on her phone recording dialogue. <laughs> yeah, we want to watch the screen now. <laughs> yeah, that's what it feels like. It's like this is from another movie again. Yeah, it's very obviously not a part, not a part of the original story. So what did you think watching it this time? I actually enjoyed it. I still like a lot of the visuals. I like the idea. uh, Well, for one thing, I I like this cast as well. I like just about everybody in it. Um, I'm trying to think of if there's anybody. I'm not super familiar with the, the blonde gal that pops up in the, you know, with all the wires. Oh, Elizabeth Debicki? Yeah, I know I've seen her in some stuff, but the, everybody else on there are, has been in shows or movies that I've watched and really enjoyed. Uh, Gugu, M- is it Mbathara? Mbathara, yep. She was on a show with Kiefer Sutherland that my wife and I watched. Didn't la- I don't think it lasts more than a season, but she's in a lot of interesting stuff. I, I like Chris Dowd. I like pretty much everybody in it, so that part's fun. And uh, what's his name from... And glorious bastards, the the German actor. I really like all of them. So I like the actors. I like a lot of the funky body horror stuff that's going on, and it grossed my daughter out. So that was fun. The worms. She she's she has an aversion to on screen vomit, and so <laughs> so when that scene happens with the Russian guy up there, she was like, oh god. And then it's all, you know, it's just like all over him and stuff. She was not digging that. I, I, again, I kind of like, if they had just left it alone, I probably would have liked this even better than having that funky tacked on ending and the insert of that news broadcast. So the movie is directed by Julius Ona. It's screenplay by Orion Utzel Uzel, Orin Uzel. Or an oozle. It's produced once again by our good friend, Mr. J.J. Abrams. And like you mentioned, Gugu Mbatha-Ra, Elizabeth Debicki, Daniel Brühl, Chris O'Dowd, Daniel David Olawayo. Jesus Christ, how many more good actors? And yeah, it, it takes place on a space station, the Cloverfield Station, where they're trying to solve the energy crisis by doing particle acceleration. Um, as for me, yeah. So you mentioned kind of the weird marketing thing after the Super Bowl movie comes out. Everybody watches it. I fucking hate it the first time i watched it <laughs> and again it's just like what like it i remember thinking okay so what does this have to do with cloverfield and then it felt like in 10 cloverfield lane it was tacked on on this it was like nailed on like it was like it was like hung on as it's running out the door like jesus christ they didn't even there was like it's like the Lacroix of cloverfield you know they whiffed the Lacro- the cloverfield name over it like there you know it has the monster at the end and then you know i've gone and read things and listened to people postulate about how does this connect to cloverfield and if you play this movie with cloverfield the original movie the moment they turn the particle accelerator on is the moment the creature shows up mhm yeah i've heard that which is fine, 
but they've already explained where the creature came from. And 10 Cloverfield Lane had nothing to do with Cloverfield. This one d- does question mark. I It gives them multiple the, universes exist here. Yes. Yeah. It gives them the opportunity to explain like, well, his that's Donald Logue's whole speech. You can have these multiple, you, you know, it will even disrupt the time space continuum where you have multiple universes and where they will interact. So you can kind of explain the different timelines of the first two movies and this one, this one doesn't have to happen before the events of Cloverfield or of 10 Cloverfield lane. They can be happening simultaneously because we have alternate universes. Right. So they're, they're, it's, I mean, it's just, it's like comics. It's like the right, comics. It's like books. multiverse, it's like Dr. Strange. It's, it's, bef- it's like those, like though, but when I was a kid, because they started creating that stuff because, you know, back in the day, back in like the silver and the bronze age, when people were writing different stories. So let's say Iron Man shows up in a Spider-Man comic and does something. And that's now one timeline. Right, you got to keep track of that too. And, instead of just, you know, it's just a, it's a one-off. It's just a, it's just a comic book. It's a one-off. He doesn't have to adhere to what he does in the normal Iron right. Man, but it creates now this thing where, oh, well, we have to connect everything. And the only way that we can actually really do that is to say, oh, there are separate timelines, and it becomes a cheat. And and it that's the thing about the MCU and other properties that do this that ends up making me tune out because i can't keep track of all that shit in my little pea brain well and the stakes disappear too when you're like well iron man's dead in our universe but in every other right. one it's alive and it's like well, what does it matter then right and for this movie i was like oh no i'm not going to be able to keep track of what's it's pretty it's pretty simple well There's... the movie doesn't even explain it <laughs> Kind of, All the explanation is really done after the fact outside of the movie. It gives you some kind of gives you some kind of way. It gives you some ideas as to what it wants you to think. And you kind of have to extrapolate the rest on your own. Yeah. But as fine. far as as far as the I'm thinking more of the two space stations that exist in this right. film. Right. Because because of the Elizabeth DeBecky character showing up inside a wall. It's like, oh, she was part of the crew. She's basically Tam's character in this universe. And so I thought, oh, crap, they're going to start dealing with multiverse and I'm not going to be able to follow along. But it's really just those two separate space stations where the crew is a little bit different. Gugu and Batha-Ra's character is not on the ship in the one timeline that they're currently in now after they they you know, mess with the, the particle accelerator. She stayed home. Uh, that gives us that drama with her as to what her decision is going to be based on the fact that she in the previous timeline she had lost her kids because of this bad decision that she had made blah 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 so i was able to follow it but that stuff can really throw me off and i understand why it's used it's used to make these things able to exist at the same time right which is lazy in a way but can lead to creative things i guess i just don't think that they really it really works in this well and that's you know that's the thing i I guess and this is going to be my interpretation of what's going on through reading all this stuff and and you know my own kind of interpretation of, of the facts and things that were presented through these three films so the Cloverfield station is the essential progenitor of all the bad things that happened both in the original film and in 10 Cloverfield Lane. When they turn the thing on, somehow, some way, no explanation is given. Frankly, no explanation is needed. It's very event horizon-y in a lot of ways. They turn it on. And by doing that, it's actually Doom. I mean, Event Horizon ripped Doom off because essentially the plot of Event Horizon is almost the plot of Doom. You're accessing the other side with a portal. They do the same thing here by smashing the atoms together. They have created a tear in space time. Happens in Spider-Man with the Spider-Man showing up. It's used this magic there, but it's essentially the same idea. It's the weakened, weakened spots. And then you rip it open with a particle accelerator. And I guess in doing that, 
creatures from other places like in the like in the mouth of madness you're accessing somewhere else unbeknownst to us i keep having to reference other things that don't explain anything either because this movie's trafficking in that and i think that pissed a lot of people off and i also i'm a fan but not a fan i guess when they turned it on they smashed these universes together these four technically two different cloverfield paradox ones and then a cloverfield and a 10 Cloverfield Mm -hmm. Lane, Mm -hmm. they had various kinds of creatures come through in 10 Cloverfield Lane. The ones that we see in that movie to again, not discounting there may be the Cloverfield monster. It's just running around in New York. Who knows? Right. Right. We don't, we don't know. They say seaboard. So you're led to believe there must be a lot of, um, but she's only underground for like three days. So they lost (laughs) pretty quickly, uh, which is kind of funny. And then in this movie, you see the Cloverfield creature from the first one. Right. So at Just least more giant. Right. At least in these three, you know, this the two Cloverfield station universes and the OG Cloverfield universe, they're having to deal with this this creature. Maybe <clears throat> now here's a thing that I've been thinking. Maybe that creature exists in our universe. It attacks New York, whatever. The Cloverfield name has some importance somehow, clearly. I don't think it's it's not, you know, they they keep saying, well, these are all Cloverfield movies. Maybe because the station's called Cloverfield, mm. it makes other things, like, I don't know. I, I'm trying right, to figure right. out a way. Yeah, but Cloverfield, the name is somehow important because all the events associated with Cloverfield Station have the name Cloverfield in them somehow, whatever. But I guess maybe my interpretation is the Cloverfield monster in the original movie exists on Earth. It comes from the bottom of the ocean. And somehow when they smash the universes together, that creature ended or a version of it ended up somewhere else. And it grew there because they say in OG Cloverfield, it's a baby. Right, right. And that's the other thing they do. You know, J.J. Abrams has said that in the OG Cloverfield movie, the Cloverfield monster's dead. They killed it with the hammer down protocol where they nuked Manhattan, I guess. So it's dead, which means it can die. But the version in Cloverfield Paradox is an adult. So maybe I don't know. I would like to believe that the Cloverfield monster in the original movie did come from the bottom of the ocean just by smashing our universes together. It ended up in New York some, or it ended up in wherever this universe. I don't know. That's the problem with this movie. The tact on nature raises more questions than need to be raised. And I don't think those questions have any exciting or interesting answer because I don't think they were intending to ask them. I think they're just a byproduct of a disjointed, quote, universe, unquote. Yeah, they're working backwards toward making the connections instead of having something planned out from the beginning, which is how a lot of people felt as they watched the show lost unfold Mm -hmm. (laughs) despite them saying, Oh no, we had a plan all along. It's like, really? Did you? Uh, Cause this last season don't feel like it anyway. But I think for me, like I, you know, to, to, to answer the question of what do I think about this movie? I don't mind this movie. Actually. I think, I, even with the Cloverfield connection, like, you know, yeah. the stuff with her husband on Earth feels as tacked on as it is because mm-hmm. it's mm-hmm. clearly it is clearly what is the addition to this that makes it Cloverfield along with, like you mentioned, the kind of the news, yeah. the the news report with Donald Logue's character essentially just saying exposition. Here I am. Let me explain to you what you're about to see. And <laughs> everything I say, just like everything his relative John Goodman says you know, comes to fruition. Right. People always like to talk about this thing where it's like, well, a character in the movie said like, if a character in the movie is saying that's what they think this is now, stranger things aside, because they decided not to do that, even though they did it in this most recent season, they kind of said one thing and then it was something else. Nine times out of 10, that is the writer telling you what it is. Right. (laughs) Like nine, 10 times out of 10, frankly, like they're not, they don't, sometimes they don't feel obligated to give you backstory. They just have a character say, that's what they think it is. And that serves as the backstory. Anyways, you see it all the time and all kinds of things. Uh, I mean, Jesus, Jesus Christ in in Silence of the Lambs, they traffic in that hardcore. It's Hannibal Lecter talking about what he thinks. It's never confirmed in the movie that's actually what's going on, but 
you can be led to believe that Hannibal Lecter is probably right. And if the screenwriter is telling you that, then that's what they believe, at least the internal logic that they're operating under. So, I mean, and that's a problem for a lot of people. And I don't blame them for not wanting to have a movie like this one really expecting you to work for it. <laughs> it's like it's not the narrative on its own does not need that. It's it's a fucking space station movie. It's like right. Event Horizon Light. Yeah, and that's what I kept thinking of when I was watching it because I I am more familiar with that movie now than probably the first time I watched this. I've seen it a, two or three times since then, and thinking, oh yeah, this is just that, but not not so much with horror elements added or uh, you know Satan <laughs> like literal, literal space Satan added. But I yeah I enjoyed it too much more than the first time. I don't think I hated it the first time. I just remember. Like I said, being kind of flummoxed by, again, what is the point of shoehorning these things in to what probably could have been a fairly interesting just drop on Netflix movie on its own, just right. a sci-fi. And, and and they could have made and they could have done what you talked about this time. And it even made more sense, which was do the thing that they didn't split and leave it for the audience to find at the end. Leave the Cloverfield right. monster out until the end of the movie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, don't even. No, I'm saying like, don't even call it Clover. Right, right. Just again, right? Like they. I don't think they they can let themselves rely on word of mouth. They can, they don't trust the audience is what this is. Because every, I mean, just think about it. Either of those two movies, everybody would have been sp- not necessarily spoiling it, but at least spoiling that surprise of it within it's a Cloverfield. The movie. First, hey, you'll never guess. It's another Clover. So. Have you seen um, Overlord? So that's what I wanted to ask you about because that, (laughs) so I haven't seen Overlord, but you've seen A Quiet Place, right? Uh, Yeah, I've seen A Quiet Place. You know, that was the other one. Oh, that was the other. That was the other. I just remembered Overlord. Right. So, yeah. So there are two. uh, And that, and that, that kind of came to light a little bit more recently, I think, that, yeah, I I think it was, uh, they were like, it was being, A Quiet Place was developed as the fourth Cloverfield Mm. movie. And they were like, okay, maybe like it'll work as its own thing, which is really funny because, man. Knowing that <laughs> those monsters in Ten Cloverfield Lane look just like the monsters in A Quiet Place, that That's same like the same like mouth thing where it's like an asshole mouth and it like opens. Uh, uh, yeah, it's strange. That's interesting. That that uh, might have actually worked in that one. Yeah. Again. Okay. Because that's sort of what we're talking about. That far, farmhouse, sm- uh, small dogs, straw dogs yeah. uh, with aliens. Yeah. And just I mean, lose the, the whole... just lose the gimmick. I mean, there's the yeah. that movie lives on its gimmick. Yeah, right. Which is why I was not a huge fan of that movie. I was then, not, not. I'm not a gimmick man myself. It, so it's just kind of funny that they they have made the decision like, ah, maybe this isn't the brightest idea, and uh, yeah, Overlord was going to be connected as well to this Cloverfield universe. Like this is, I think the original talk was. You know, somebody at some point mentioned, oh, and the next one's going to take place in Nazi Germany. And because you can have this happen anywhere, right? You can, once they set that particle accelerator off and it ripped the time space continuum, creatures can pop out at any point in history. So, which you know, is a cool fucking idea. It, it's an, uh, fine, like, what it's an a fine anthology idea. series, huh? No, like, what, what a way they, to, what a way to what set they your did anthology with series up. Yeah. It, it's oh, what they just did oh. with Prey, because you can do that, too, because they're aliens who ha- are obviously way more advanced uh, tech- um, technically than us, technology-wise. And so why not have it set in the 1700s? Why not have it set 200 years prior to that? Why yeah. not have it set a 1800s, 90? Why not? Uh, that And that doesn't have to include any kind of alternate universes that's just hey this is an advanced species that can travel to other worlds already even 300 years in our past so yeah that i like the idea of having these things i'm they do it with alien the alien franchise in a way as well what about underwater remember that movie yeah, they talked about that one being a Cloverfield movie makes, too, and it makes has sense. T.J. Miller and John Gallagher Jr. in it. <laughs> I, 
why? You know, I I mean, again, you, you fuck it. You know what's fucked up? You could make any movie a Cloverfield movie if you really went far enough. Like, OK, I mean, you know, the conceit is that the Cloverfield station created a monster invasion of some kind. OK, so what there's let's just go down the list of movies, you know, Battle for Los Angeles could be a Cloverfield movie. Realistically, you know, what I mean, it's like, right, where do right. you stop? And that's the question that they have to ask themselves here, because the next Cloverfield movie probably isn't going to. I mean, they've said it's not going to be found footage, but who knows? They may change their minds. I mean, again, I, I don't know if I care about a Cloverfield movie that's not found footage. Would that be weird? Like, do you want to see a Cloverfield? Cloverfield 2, not a found footage. Because that's what they've kind of said. But again, you know, under advisement uh, until it actually comes out. Yeah, I don't think. Like, what? This is it just Godzilla then? Right. That's true. I mean, I think it could work as one if they st- sort of stick to what worked so well on the first one because i would actually not being a huge fan of found footage i'd probably watch it out of curiosity same i mean again the first one is a successful found footage movie everything else is kind of up in the air for a found footage movie it's probably the best made found footage movie you'll find technically it's a technically impressive film like it's technically impressive matt reeves does a lot more okay everything else Everything else, even fucking Matt Reeves made a found footage movie. I mean, that Planet of the Apes movie, the one with Woody Harrelson, was my favorite movie the year it came out. Everybody has raved on and on about the Batman. Matt Reeves knows what he's doing. He's never going to make another found footage movie. I can wager you that. And from what I have heard, he probably didn't want to make the first one anyways. Yeah, I I, um, it Di- wouldn't bother director me Director with it a was. capital D, let's put it that way. Hey, I'm a fan of Let Me In, so... He, Matt Reeves is a great director, great screenwriter as well. I like Matt Reeves a lot. Like I said, that Planet of the Apes movie with Woody Harrelson, it's a great movie. Yeah, he's done, uh, again, looking through his filmography, I've liked a lot of what he's done. I haven't seen The Batman. I don't really have much interest in DC movies, but <laughs> a lot of the stuff that he's worked on has We should been do an episode on it because I'm not going to watch it unless I'm really to talk oh, about yeah. it. That's all right. <laughs> it's three hours long. Yeah. It's I, hey, you know what though? It it does draw on some people that you and I both do like. It's, apparently, there's a lot of Fincher in there with hmm. uh, with the whole Riddler is very much like the Zodiac killer. Interesting. Yeah, that was why I wanted to watch it because everybody was telling me that like Riddler was very Zodiac esque, and I there is like that there is that Zodiac. leaked scene online that's pretty much just them doing the whole Buffalo Bill or the Hannibal <laughs> the whole Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. J- uh, Jodie Foster thing with Batman yeah. and the Joker, which I thought was really clever, but also they did it better in Silence of the Lamb. Yeah. <laughs> but to put it in Batman's clever, yeah. I would watch it, but I'm not running out to watch um, it. Yeah, I, I don't know. It's a we'll big, see. it's a big, it's a big ask. It's three hours. It's two <laughs> movies. And I like Robert Pattinson just fine. So it's nothing against him. Yeah, no, Robert Pattinson's a great actor. No, I'm I'm interested to see what we get with Cloverfield 2. Uh, if it does end up being a non-found footage movie, I think that could be interesting. I, I would, for me, I, I would do it something akin to like, uh, like World War Z, but the book where it's like telling the story after the fact of what happened with the, like how the world reacted to the Cloverfield incident and then the fallout from that. Like, I think that could be interesting. But again, it it begs the question, what version, what, what is Clover, what is Cloverfield 2? Is Cloverfield 2 a movie that takes place in the original Cloverfield universe? Is it a movie about other universes where the Cloverfield paradox, because again, Cloverfield paradox is a real movie that exists that has now opened up a box of when they turned the switch on, all these bad things happened. So what is Cloverfield 2 now that we know that? Now that we know Cloverfield wasn't just a monster from the bottom of the ocean, or maybe it was, but there was more stuff going on. Yeah, well, they've opened it up to any number of possibilities. Infinite. But will they go back to the aftermath of that original? Because the movie seems opens like it- with Rob picking the camera up, like that would blow my <laughs> mind. I would be like, that is not what I was thinking this was going to be at all. I mean, TJ Miller might not even be dead, you know? I, I mean, mean, he got he just- bitten in half, didn't he? Oh, that's true. That's true. He did. Yeah, he did. I forget that that <laughs> that is because he's just laying there for a minute. That and- is just that 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 scene has of all the like. 
of all the things in this entire franchise that has rubbed me the wrong way. And there have been plenty of things that scene, I think is my, the thing that has rubbed me the wrong way, the most out of anything, the scene where the monster is like staring at the camera. Like that was where I'm just like, this is, (laughs) this stopped being a random person with a camera a long time ago. And you just put a pin in it. Yeah. Because like everything else is random. Mar- Marlena, Lizzie Kaplan dying is random. Like there's all, and then all of a sudden it's like, nope, the monster is following them around. Oh, come on. Well, they might feel the same way about that guy that we did. So, <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't know. I, I, I hope maybe Cloverfield Two will be something completely just bonkers off the wall. I mean, that's my hope. Is if they, they've, they've kind of gone all over the place as it is. Like they've had plenty of time to figure out something smart. So. Not that that's what'll happen, but they've had plenty of time to consider it. And uh, Joe Barton, uh, he's worked on a BBC show called Geary Haji that sounds pretty interesting. It's a uh, Tokyo detectives who work in London. That sounds hmm. definitely like something interesting and worth checking out. So it's not like they're getting. I mean, that's the thing. Drew Goddard is not unsuccessful as a screenwriter either maybe you know what maybe it's a good thing it's not going to be found footage because that means people who know how to tell narratives don't need to feel hamstrung by telling it in a admittedly strange narrative format yeah yeah i genuinely think cloverfield will be the biggest budget found footage movie we ever see like i I don't know how could anything ever exceed it right it's its own thing maybe you know what it, it kind of was successful in a way when you say Cloverfield, like ultimately as a franchise, it has legs. It's going on 14 years now. Yeah. Well, and if you say Cloverfield, most people are going to probably think of the first film. I would think of a certain age, right? I think some people will think of the people my age will probably think of the original movie. I think some people, I don't know who would think of 10 Cloverfield Lane, but I think you would get a lot of people also going, oh, the movie from the Super Bowl. Yeah. Because yeah. like everybody and their mother saw the trailer for it. I'm not sure how many people actually watched it, even out well, of curiosity. If you say Cloverfield to me, though, I will. I'm the one of the people that will think of Tin Cloverfield Lane first. Right. So. Which I totally get. <laughs> I mean, I, to- I totally, totally get that. It's the one out of those three, at least, that I will return to. I know. I, I enjoyed actually watching all three of them. Watched, I think when I started watching Cloverfield Paradox... Cleo wasn't really paying attention, but it sort of sucked her in. I think she had just woken up. I was like, I, this was on Monday. We were supposed to record on Tuesday. So I was getting it in and she hadn't quite woken up yet, but she came out. And then I was like, oh, this is the the final Cloverfield movie. And she was playing her game or something and at some point stopped and kind of got herself hooked into it. So I didn't even mention like I actually like Cloverfield Paradox a lot. Like, I think I may have liked it more than 10 Cloverfield Lane. I liked it. I liked it a lot this time. I again, the body horror stuff. You know, I think there should have been more. Of of there would have been more of it. Like his eye going sideways really creeped both me and Cleo out. I was like, oh yeah, I forgot about that part. And then you think, oh no, what's going to come out of his eye? Come out of his eye, but stuff does come out. That idea of not only the shared universe, but the stuff in their space station ending up in the wrong place. Right. Is fun for me. Chris Dowd losing his arm. I enjoyed that part. And for the most part, I think that the effects are done very well in that. But yeah, I, I actually enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot more than I remember enjoying it the first time. I just think I was kind of like, oh, this was silly. But Netflix has had a lot of silly movies over the last few years that are kind of fun. That uh, woman in the window thing with Amy Adams is just bonkers, but my wife and I really enjoy watching never wa- it. Never watched it's it. It's insane. It's insane. It's like it's everybody forgot how to act like a human being in that movie. It's so amazing. And they're all in they're all in different movies. That based it's, got a great on a cast. Book? it's based on a book, right? I think so, yeah. And Amy Adams, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee, Gary Oldman. Wyatt Russell, all these great people in it. It's just weird. And then the one with Amanda Seyfried, too, that's, I think, sort of a similar story that they talk about shitting the bed at the end. Both of those movies do that. And this just feels like one of those weird Netflix films that they kind of just go all out on and make something weird. So I I give them credit for that. And Elizabeth Debicki is good as the villain, like, and her 
motivation actually makes perfect sense. Mm-hmm. She's not she's not even really the villain in right. a way. Right. Like she's just like, no, 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 you don't understand. I'll kill all y'all if that means <laughs> I save our earth. Right. And yeah. you know for a fact that these two other assholes would have done the same thing. I mean, yeah. The Daniel Bruhl and Gugan Bathara are good, but they're, I mean, again, their characters are just like, they, it's like they can't understand why she's doing it. It's like, no, 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 you guys, like, you would do the same thing. Yes, they, that, and I was going, wait a minute, she's right. They're being selfish. Right. Like, like what is, what, what really, what is she going to do going back? A, a version of her already exists. Just be. Uh, just get solace from the notion that your children are alive with your husband and you in this universe that we're now sh- sharing, you know, that we're now in. But why can't you find solace in that? What are you going to do? Go kill the other version of yourself? Do uh, Doctor Strange, Wonder Woman, or uh, Doctor Strange and uh, Wanda thing from uh, Multiverse, right? Go scare the shit out of your kids. <laughs> well, and you'd have to kill the other version of yourself. Right. I wish they had done more body horror. Yeah. I remembered more actually. Right. Me too. I was like, I thought there was more here because there's the Chris O'Dowd arm thing. There's the guy who's vomiting the worms and that's it. And, and I then, guess the way Chris and, O'Dowd dies. Well, on her in the wall. With right. Wires, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. she's connect kind of connected to the <laughs> interior of that yeah. space. Yeah. I, I was like, wait a minute. Okay. That was the last instance. Okay. I'm misremembering and, this. And, and his arm is never exposed. Explained. Not really. No, how does his just... arm auto writing and knowing how to auto write and knows that the guy has the thing inside it and knows things that he doesn't know. Right. It's like his arm went to a different universe or is in a it's, different universe. Yeah. Like it's attached to his other self on the other ship, I guess maybe is how that's supposed to work. Yeah. So it knows what that version of him knows. Maybe. I guess that's probably what they were getting at. Yeah. Or did the other version of him lose his arm as well? And in doing so, that's his arm and his arms in the other universe. Sure. Why not? Who cares? <laughs> right. I don't know. That was like, that's the only kind of like, that was the only kind of thing where I was like, I don't know. That's an unanswered question, but it doesn't need to be answered. Doesn't add anything to the plot. But I, yeah, I like this movie a hell of a lot more this time than I did last time. Yeah, me too. Me too. Enough time so has that been I kind watch- to this movie. <laughs> enough so that I would watch it again for sure. Yeah. And uh, Julius Ona making a name for himself. Uh, He's directing the upcoming Captain America movie. Hmm. So this movie being kind of a dud, because I think overwhelmingly the opinion is this movie is not good, didn't have a uh, negative effect on his uh, career, which is good. And it didn't really on anyone else. I mean, Gugu Mbatha-Ra, Elizabeth Debicki, they would all go on to work with Marvel and other people yeah. and or have great careers of their. I mean, Chris O'Dowd, Jesus Christ, David O'Leary. They're all, yeah, they're all still... Yeah, showing this, up in all this, kinds of stuff. This movie was pretty heavily lambasted when it came out. I remember there was very, very few, if any, positive opinions about this movie <laughs> being thrown around. Yeah, and, which is a I, shame because, like you said, the, the cast really is so strong. Yeah, everybody in it is. I, I'm just kept thinking, oh, oh, he's in. Oh, yeah, she's in. Oh, boy, good cast. <laughs> yeah, I really wish they had gone further with the body horror. I mean, there's a point where Elizabeth Debicki is ass first being sucked out of a window. And I wish they had done. I always remember uh, the last time I watched it, I was like, there's got to be like a alien resurrection style thing where she's getting sucked guts first out of the thing. And they didn't do that. And it feels like a missed opportunity. You know, that that for me is the thing. It's like they could have gone further. And it feels like because it's a Cloverfield movie, they couldn't. Yeah. I remember when she flew into that glass, I was like, oh, clearly she's getting sucked out by her butt. <laughs> yeah. Like that should have been a moment where it's like she's getting her guts ripped out and, and you know, just like an yeah. alien resurrection and they don't do it here. And it's it's a shame. It's a it's a completely and totally a missed opportunity. And that kind of just feels like this movie in a nutshell. They have a great cast and there are some fun moments. And yeah, it is a Cloverfield movie, I guess. Yeah, I would like to live in the original universe that this particle accelerator didn't create where i could see the versions of tin cloverfield lane and the god particle without the the seller and the god part yeah what those would have ended up being because again i think they're interesting concepts on their own i like the idea of a woman in peril film and i like the idea of a experiment in space gone wrong deal where even if it was shared universe which i'm sure was a part of the initial story then you you've got 
all kinds of stuff you can do just with having two space stations in alternate timelines trying to get home or trying to solve different problems. One's trying to repair itself, one's trying to get home or one, you know. Right. You know, at some point in that, in Paradox, they are shown news footage that shows that they've crashed. Right. And so you have that interesting concept. You've got, yes, her uh, struggle with knowing that her family is whole and safe in this timeline. What is the compunction then to mess that up? That could, without a big, huge creature popping out at the end over the clouds, you don't need any of that to have a compelling story. There's enough in those stories to make an interesting film, I think, which is why then they stopped and let A Quiet Place be A Quiet Place and let Overlord be Overlord. Like, these are fine stories on their own. Yeah. And and with this one, with the addition of the Cloverfield name, they had to contend with adding the footage of what was going on on Earth with her husband, which nobody cares about. Right. It doesn't yeah, I, anything. I, I forgot how tacked on that felt, too. Yeah. Like, and let's look, have him. He's got to do some stuff. So, so let's give him a an orphan. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And what's strange is, I, I, you know, as I was watching these two movies, I was trying to kind of figure out which one I felt was more tacked on. Because ultimately, to talk about the Cloverfield movies, you know, we always talk about three movies. At least that's what it feels like. You know, we're talking about what feels like one movie and then two other tonally different movies. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and it's it's like, what does it mean to talk about the Cloverfield movies? And it's like, well, you're talking about a really well-made found footage movie. And then you're talking about a really interesting kind of Hitchcock in paranoid thriller. Yeah. And then, you know, a mid night, mid to late nineties space station thriller, which is a thing. I mean, event, a fucking event horizon. My God. Right. I mean, that's what this hue's closest to event horizon. What's the other one? Um, Supernova. Yeah. Supernova. Uh, there's one other. What am I thinking of? But anyway, but you know, that's those are genre, sub genre, niche genres in their own, you know, sci fi genre. And so that's fun that that's like, oh, we're going to do this with these movies and we're going to, it's kind of be loosely attached. But it, if you're, if you're going to do that, be more adept at connecting them because that is the real failing here is the way these movies are connected. If you're, if, okay, we can't do anything about the fact they're connected, right? You keep saying you want to live in the universe where you could see them without the connection. I agree with you, but let's take into account. They have to be connected. How could they have fixed this is the question. And that is really doing a better job at integrating the Cloverfield, finding a better way to, to, juxtapose the original Cloverfield and what happened in that movie with what you're going to be doing in these movies and how you connect them. Because yeah, those original script, at least for the seller is clearly a really well done script. I can't speak to the God particle because again, it seems like that may have been, but maybe not. I mean, the God particle movie is good on its own. I mean, the non Cloverfield parts is good. So yeah, those are probably good scripts on their own. So the question is why not do a better job of integrating the Cloverfield parts as opposed to just tacking them on the end both time. Yeah. And I think it's mainly that again, they're working backward and they're about as backward as you can get. They're not, buying pre-made scripts, right? Pre stuff that they just had sitting there. Like we talked about earlier, that's where these other franchises have pulled a lot of their sequels scripts that they already had probably had no intention of doing anything with them, but you've paid for them and you have a successful IP. So make a diehard movie out of this. Yeah. Otherwise banal action movie. You've that got nobody is going to go and see probably because you just have an IP. You just rename. Yeah. You just rename a couple characters. It's really, you know, it's as simple as that. And, and some of those films. And so I think I think the whole point for me is just start with an original idea because now you've you've made it to where there has to be alternate universes instead of things taking place. I mean the world is a big place, Chris. I don't know if you realize this. It is. And not everybody lives in New York City, so you can have the straw dogs versus aliens in some other state. You can have the the Cloverfield paradox because it's taking place in space with an international cat. They can all be taking place at the same time. Yeah. Is what, or, is or, what even I'm kind, or even like kind of after one another, even like the Cloverfield paradox created the event that brought everything through and those things being brought through, like you said, are being brought in at the same time. And then all the, those are, these other stories are maybe not that specific day, but the fallout of that. 
Right. And it can continue on because In we don't know how many monsters there are around the world. But then they have to go and do multiverses instead. To cover up the, the plot holes, the connecting holes between them. Like, well, yeah. if that happened, then how does the space time wasn't in the water already? Or blah, blah, blah. well, that and that's the thing. Like you were mentioning with the satellite landing at the end of Cloverfield, because it's like, well, that, well, that's something, and like, but it's not anything now. So I don't, I don't know. I, I, I have kind of a love hate relationship with Cloverfield. I'm excited that they're making another one. It's gonna be weird as a like a grown ass adult to go see a Cloverfield movie, possibly in theaters again for the first time since '08. But depending on what it is, it could be pretty good. It could be a lot of fun. It could be something. Yeah. Co- it could be something that we can't even comprehend, like uh, some sort of right, really right. strange idea. Again, like Ten Cloverfield Lane like that. is kind of weird. Cloverfield Paradox is kind of weird. Maybe this will be kind of weird. I hope it is. It's one of the weirdest franchises that I can think of. For sure, that that has like a major name attached to it that people even, actually take seriously. Yeah. Yeah. Even though we given all these examples of where we know this happens and it, it happens, it ha- it's not a modern concept. This has happened over the ages with people, you know, com- studios buying scripts or having even in the old studio system where you had somebody re- and then they change it. They change it to fit something that's already successful. Right. And it's not a modern concept, but it's and also one of the things I hate about it is that it's a very cynical way of making movies to kind of try and fool the audience in a way when it's very apparent that these things didn't start out as part of this universe. We're capitalizing on on an, on a on a name on a successful yeah. because from what I understand, the first Cloverfield was rather successful. Well, and that's so, the thing. It's like you know, blood in the water, right? Right, and yeah, exactly. But movie was 25 million made 175 who it's just a weird who goes my my big takeaway from any of it is like who approaches films this way like 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 we've said multiple times just come up with something (laughs) that actually makes sense. You want the answer cynical industry types. Yeah, I mean, and you would think that. I don't know, uh, someone who apparently loves movies as much as J.J. Abrams would maybe lean more in the direction we're leaning in. Like, why are we doing this and not just coming up? Well, because the script's already there and it's already bought. Okay, well, uh, this idea was kaiju movies. He was like, he essentially has said, you know, I went, I was in Japan with my son. I saw all these monster toys and I was like, why don't we have ours? And that's a good question. Like, why is there not a Western? I mean, King Kong, but I guess King Kong's not good enough for you. So you got to make your own thing, which is fine. But you know what? And we didn't really even talk about it. And I think this is the best way to close this episode. Cloverfield Monster. Well, you don't ever really get the greatest look at it across right. three movies. No, nope. and, and in two, it's like a completely different creature. Yeah, but like not a great design. Yeah, it's not one a of those... memorable design. It kind of looks like the creature from Super Eight. <laughs> oh, right, remember that right. movie? Yes, Fuck, yes. didn't even mention that. That yeah. movie that totally was apparently just Clover. I don't know what the yeah. hell that was. I still uh, don't could, understand what Super you 8 could was. could actually tack that on because, again, it's a different timeline, but the timeline doesn't matter. It could be the same. Honestly, I feel like I dreamed Super 8 existed. Right? You it's could, weird. You could. I mean, really, didn't even think about that film, but it fits in. Don't they have slush shows? I mean, it's a J.J. Abrams It's a J.J. Joint, Abrams right? movie. It's, it's written, be directed, Kelvin and, and produced by him. There's got to be Kelvin and Slusho and everything else in that. So, yeah, it's a, it, I'm calling it. It's a Cloverfield movie. Well, I mean, again, and the, is, the, is the alien in that altruistic? Is it, under, is it a misunderstood yeah. alien? Yes, yes, it is. Mm. So it's essentially just his E.T. I mean, isn't Super 8 just like his love letter to Spielberg movies? Yeah. It's just, it, you know what the problem is? And, and maybe it's not a problem. J.J. Uh, Abrams may never be able to get out from underneath Cloverfield is what it feels like. And, or lost, hey, or lost for that matter. He created that monster, so I, he well, needs that's my to sleep point. with it. That's my point. <laughs> I mean, it it for me has always been, you know, J.J. Abrams has always been the Mr. Mystery Box man. And Cloverfield's Mystery Box was so good that it was like fucking Geraldo Rivera outside of that 
Al Capone's safe. I mean, Cloverfield's good, but it's ultimately empty popcorn entertainment. And it's like, okay, like that was great. But you know what? The ARG was so good and everything else was so good. And then you get to the movie and the movie is, it's okay. Nobody nobody forced him to create this mess. Nope. That's what <laughs> so. it feels like, almost like a mess. Like It feels like someone gave J.J. Abrams a trowel and he started digging a hole. And then at some point he's like, give me a shovel. I want to keep making this hole bigger. <laughs> and then at some point you look down from your, your fucking hole you've dug yourself and go, what can I do now? Yeah, how do I get out of this? Make Cloverfield 2 a Godzilla movie with a fucking gen- genuinely vanilla structure and narrative and just make it the Godzilla movie that you were talking about making. I don't know. Maybe or, it's as good of option as any. I know sure. it's a stop motion animation film. Ooh, It's like, uh, what if it was what if it was the character that Jennifer Garner plays from Alias <laughs> and Chris Pine from Star Trek as James Kirk? And Ethan Hawke from that one Mission Impossible that J.J. Abrams directed fighting the Cloverfield monster. And Bradley Cooper has got to be in it. Right. He was on Alias, too. Oh, right. Yeah, right. That's where he got his start. And that's, yep. yeah, yeah. Yeah, Cloverfield feels feels like this weird, just like, what are you doing, man? Yeah, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bizarre concept. There's nothing else like it. If he was trying to make something, I mean, he was trying to make a kaiju movie, and instead he made something unclassifiably strange so is colossal a part can we include colossal in the Anne hathaway movie yeah uh pro i mean again prop that's my (laughs) point like it it, it, like with anything like you could take cloverfield and really apply it to anything where something happens that seems completely without reason or explanation that involves cloverfield paradox yeah Yeah. that involves a giant monster godzilla 1999 sure why not king kong versus godzilla why not that's what we need. Godzilla versus King Kong versus Clover. 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 <laughs> Clover. That doesn't sound so bad. Oh, look at Clover. <laughs> and it opens its fucking mouth. It and looks like goes, a bat. Boom, boom, boom. It looks like yeah. a bat is what it looks mm-hmm. like, really. Mm-hmm. So, uh, Mr. Begley, final mm-hmm. final thoughts on uh, final thoughts on Cloverfield. The Cloverfield trilogy as it stands today. It's bizarre, but I think individually each of these films is fun to watch. And I'm still a very big fan of Tin Cloverfield Lane. Uh, I think it's very smart. And the lead character is very smart and doesn't do stupid things. I mean, she does a couple of stupid things, but you can understand those stupid things based on what she thinks is going on. They're all pretty fun. And I enjoyed watching all three of them this time around. So get out there and watch them. Yeah, I think for me, you know, my opinion on the first one is kind of definitely cooled off in the last 14 years. It's a weird movie. I mean, this whole thing is weird. Again, there's there's no other way to quantify it. It's just whatever is happening over at Bad Robot with Cloverfield is they I hope they know because I couldn't begin to have a fucking inkling of an idea what the hell's going on. First one is short, though. Let's give it that at least. Oh, yeah. It's 80 minutes. Yeah. What a a breezy, you know. (laughs) And yeah, Cloverfield Lane is fun up until the ending. And Cloverfield Paradox, I had a lot more fun with it this time around. And I would honestly, my biggest takeaway from this episode is I would genuinely tell anyone who feels a certain way about that Cloverfield Paradox movie, go check it out again. It's not that yeah, bad. I think removed from that whole weird hype thing and the Super Bowl deal and the, the that marketing push for that movie, I agree. I th- I enjoyed it way more than i expected i was halfway through and i was like wait a minute i don't dislike this in right. any way shape or form it's not bad yeah i just remember watching it the first time and being like my god like this is <laughs> awful so yeah you know that th- you know that's the thing about cloverfield like i kind of mentioned in the opening you know cloverfield has become kind of this weird inflection point for the movie industry because this is this weird thing that still exists and it's been involved in like big marketing it, it, events the arg for it is i would give a lot of the credit to why this movie made so much money is it's arg and then you have the cloverfield paradox which was its own big marketing event so you know cloverfield has some cachet in the industry and if you've worked on it obviously it's going to be something that people feel a certain way about and yeah i don't know where it goes from here i'm excited i can't believe i'm saying i'm excited to see another cloverfield movie but at this point everything else has been so fucking strange and all the things that were rumored to be part of this but weren't are also 
super strange, like a quiet place, like Overlord. So whatever they come up with to be the true successor to Cloverfield, the original film should, I hope, be fucking weird. Yeah. Even if it's not good, it's going to be weird. That's my hope. So. I agree. I, I, I Be out there. Yeah. As out there as you can. Because now, guess I mean, what? You don't have to make a fucking tenuous connection to Cloverfield anymore. This is Cloverfield 2. You don't have to shoehorn anything in. Like, you can you can have J.J. Abrams come out at the beginning of the movie and say, hello, everyone. Remember Cloverfield? And have him just lay out everything that's going on. And and you know what? That would be just as believable a movie as anything else. Because, again, it seems that anything can happen in this universe. But my point being, like, at this point, like, J.J. Abrams can do whatever he wants with this. And clearly he's going to. And I hope that they do. I hope that Cloverfield 2 is strange and weird and unlike the last two movies or the last three movies. Even. And that's that's I I don't know. Uh, I guess we both we both signed ourselves up to do the next Cloverfield episode, whatever the movie comes <laughs> out. But I mean, hey, I whatever it is, I hope to God it's entertaining. Right. So until then, Mr. Begley, where can people find you? You can find me over at wakeupheavy.com. And the show, wherever you listen to podcasts, and you can go listen to Mr. Chris Stashu himself and Mr. Mike White from the Projection Booth on our four-year anniversary episode on The Silence of the Lambs, which um, I'm happy to say this is a very good episode, so you should check it out. I would agree it is a good episode, and who doesn't like to talk about Silence of the Lambs? I don't know. Shit, we brought it up on this episode. <laughs> it's it's ever-present. Yeah. As for me, cstashy.com, that's my link tree. Go there for all the things that I work on, which are vast and varied. As for this show, culturecast.com, patreon.com slash culturecast, all the places you can go to do those things. But like and rate and review on iTunes, that's all you really need to do. And go listen to Mark's show, because I've done a fair amount of episodes on Mark's show, and uh, Mark's show is pretty good. Amityville. I mean, that was the one prior to Silence. You, you and Andy were on that one. Uh, uh, guys got... Poltergeist, Hellraiser? Halloween Kills. What, Halloween Kills is shared. I believe Hellraiser is is yours. It Funhouse shared. Yeah, I've shared four recently. You've done a men, lot this year, me and you. Funhouse, Men, It, uh, Crimes of the Future, Crimes of the Future, all kinds of good stuff. The, the award for who I've worked with the most this year may end up going to you, sir, because we're put we put in the time last month. Good lord. <laughs> yeah, that well, that, those four that came out in one fell swoop. Woo. Yeah. So, yeah, and um, as for this show, uh, make sure to check out the next episode. 